Good morning, New Life Church. How are y'all this morning? Good morning. Hey, my name's Thomas Welch, and I'm a shepherd here at New Life Church, and this is my wife, Susan. She's also a shepherd here with us. And uh, we just want to welcome, if we have any guests this morning, we want to welcome y'all to our church this morning. Hope you got a cookie and a cup of coffee and uh, a, a smile and a warm welcome while you were here this morning. So we're really happy that you're here with, to be a part of our services this morning. So today's a big day. I hope y'all are all excited. All right. It's sweater day, right? Everybody pulled out their sweater out of their closets that you haven't seen in six months, right? Okay. Bad joke. Bad joke. No, it's harvest party day, so we're all excited. Uh, Even though the weather's turning bad, we're going to have the harvest party indoors today. A lot of work's gone into it. Um, uh, People were up here late yesterday afternoon setting up for it, getting ready, and um, Susan's going to have some more announcements about that this morning here in just a minute. But when you came in this morning, I hope you saw Travis or one of the other greeters at the door and you got a connect card. Uh, if you will, this is how we know you were here this morning. So if you'll just fill this out for us and uh, drop it in the boxes as you go out the door a little bit later, that would be great. We're doing something new. I haven't tried this, and I see some of you already with your phones taking pictures. If you didn't get a Q, uh, get connect card, we've got the QR code, and you can take a picture of the QR code being shown up here and fill that out, and we know electronically you were here this morning. So you'd do that for us. We greatly appreciate it. Besides knowing you were here, the backside is probably the most important part that we can get every uh, week from you. This is where you fill out your prayer request or any praises or anything that's going on. Uh, our staff gets together on Tuesday afternoon and goes through these and, and, and lifts the church up in prayer. And uh, unless you mark that you want your prayer request to be confidential, they share it with the rest of us in an email later in the day uh, for uh, the rest of the church to pray for you. But uh, we, we really want to live. This is a church of prayer, and we really enjoy praying for everybody. So. Hey, also, there's the email address, prayers at newlifeodessa.org. Throughout the week, you can go on there and uh, send in your prayer request, and you'll be prayed for as well. So, uh, Also, in the same boxes on the outside out there, uh, as far as giving goes, if you brought cash or check this morning and you want to contribute to our ministries here at New Life Church and help us keep the lights on, uh, we, we encourage you to drop that gift in in the boxes uh, on your way out when you put in your Connect card. Uh, you can also give either online or by texting, and we greatly appreciate that. Um, and then, a little bit later uh, in the service, if you'll notice, we've got our communion table here in the middle of the um, auditorium. This is a big part of uh, what we come here each Sunday for is uh, to commune with God and to commune with the Holy Spirit and to uh, take remembrance of what Christ did for us on Calvary that day. And uh, understand Ross is going to come up here in just a little bit and kind of set that up for us. And uh, we're going to celebrate communion this morning. But uh, we want to encourage all of y'all to be a part of that. Um, There's tables on the outside also. Uh, on, on each side. You can go with friends and family to celebrate communion when we do that uh, as well here in just a little bit. So Susan, uh, harvest party tonight, what do we need to know about that? And um, what else is going on this week? Well, for one thing, this weather is not going to slow us down. We're going to have a great time today. I just want to take a moment to thank everyone for all the support that you've given so far. Thank you, everyone that has signed up for a boot are to do a trunk or treat, which is going to be a table of treats today. Um, I just want in advance to thank everyone um, that I know that any visitor that walks through our door is going to be very welcomed and so loved by Jesus today. So um, just some instructions. We want everyone to be here by four. That will give you plenty of time to get your table decorated for your treat and to make sure you have all of your supplies for your booth. And then, I think I 
Oh, yes. If you have a, uh, if you can stay a little bit after church, we are going to move all the chairs in here. This is where we're going to do our games, our booth. So if you could do that just right after church. Um, and then our motto today is um, make heaven crowded as we make Jesus famous. And then also on Tuesday night, we have uh, prayer warriors that meet here um, at 6 o'clock to pray for us. Oh, I'm sorry, 630. And everyone is invited. Oh. And also, Family Promise is having a celebration dinner um, Thursday, November the 2nd, from 5 to 10 in our fellowship room here at New Life Church. All right. So, hope everybody's excited. Uh, oh, hey. You get through today and this week. We got to remember this time next week. We turn our clocks back, so you get an extra hour of sleep, and my wife's fixing my collar while I'm up here. So you get an extra hour of sleep next week. Uh, you'll uh, fall back, so we'll get here an hour later, right? So just be prepared for that. If you don't set your clocks back, we might get up here a little early and, uh, and uh, wonder where everybody's at, and everybody else is getting their extra hour of sleep, so. Just remember that going into next week. But again, as soon as uh, we're done with service this morning, if, if a few of you can stay around and help us, we're going to get all these chairs out of here. And uh, that way they can come in. Uh, Lori and her team can come in and set up for the games and stuff. But Lori, are we missing anything else? Okay. Also, um. Several of our youth are going to be um, doing a game. And so if anyone, if you don't have a, a job and you are going to be here for the harvest party, if you could team up with them, that would be greatly appreciated. All right. All right. So to get ready for harvest party, if I can have Camille and all the other kids come up here. Come on, Finn. We're, this is y'all's time. We're excited to get the kids to come up here and get ready to go to class. What's going on tonight, Finn? Do you know what's going on tonight, Finn? Oh, harvest party. Harvest party. All right. The kids know what's going on tonight. So good deal. Good morning, church. <clears throat> so it's my privilege to uh, lead a communion meditation. And one of the things that I grew up as a Baptist. Don't hold it against me. I got here as soon as I could. The Baptists do things a little different when it comes to communion. They only do it quarterly. In other words, every Sunday that has a fifth, every month that has a fifth Sunday, it works out to be every quarter. And growing up as a kid, especially after I had become baptized, I felt like that's just not enough. I'm missing something. And <clears throat> the refreshing deal that you get from taking communion is a renewal of your spirit. God blesses us because we bless him. <clears throat> you know, some people call it a ritual. It's not a ritual. It's a remembrance. We are remembering Jesus' death burial, and most important, his resurrection. So I ask you, are you doing this in remembrance of him? Are you examining yourself, confessing your sins, and partaking of these emblems in a manner pleasing to him? That's all I ask. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus. What he means to us because of his death on the cross, his sacrifice, his burial, his resurrection. Father, we know that he set this ceremony aside for us to renew our spirits and to renew our hearts. Father, uh, help us partake of these emblems in a manner pleasing to you. Help us, Father, to remember all the things that he has done. 
And we pray all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Uh, uh, it's so good to see you. Uh, and you're dressed differently today. I wonder why. Um, okay. Um, so as, as I always do, I want to ask you to open your Bibles uh, on Philippians chapter 2. Uh, when we get to the passage, you'll have it ready, and so it won't uh, take any time <clears throat> to, to open the passage when we get to it. So um, we're continuing uh, our series called Winning the Race. Uh, and so as they do on television shows, they say, previously on winning the race. <laughs> so uh, just to remind you, uh, week one, we talked about the importance of winning the race. We, we talked about the importance of finishing the race with Jesus compared to versus uh, or compared to just participating in the race. Uh, yeah, uh, last, last week, week two, we talked about um, the importance of win, uh, helping others win. But we also talked about that before we can help other people win, we need to take care uh, of our spiritual health first. We talked about our relationship with God, that we need to, this is our first priority, that we need to focus on that first before we start helping others win. Uh, and so today we will continue to talk about helping others win. Um, and next week, hopefully, we'll talk about some maybe some practical uh, ways of how we can help other people win. Um, and, you know, I need, I need your help right now. And you can't say no because Jesus says you have to help people. Uh, so, but I, we, I want to do some interactive uh, part with you, and so I need some help, okay? Um, I need a few, a few married couples uh, to come up here, just, just a few. Um, can I, Brenda and Barry, could you guys come here, please? Thank you. Please don't be afraid. I mean, it's not going to be, it's not going to hurt for sure, I promise. Uh, so thank you, yeah. Um, would you guys kill with Lisa? <laughs> I'm sorry. I hate people doing it to me. So, um, and uh, Sid and Krista. <laughs> okay, well, let's do Sid and Krista. All right, so this is what we're going to do. Um, I would like for you guys to stand with your backs towards each other, like back to back, okay? <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> You'll have to, you, you have to teach me this one. Uh, um, so, this is what we'll do. You guys uh, cannot look at your spouse right now. So you have to look, you, got, you have to look straight, yeah, straight ahead. So what we'll do is, um, I have only one question for you. And you just need to tell me uh, what your spouse is wearing today. Uh, <laughs> Maybe the type of clothing and uh, the, the color, Lisa? Is this on? Dark blue plaid shirt. Okay. Uh, do you know about the... It's not tucked in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe the shoes? He's wearing his black shoes. I mean, he wears all the nice ones. Wow. Wow. Well deserved, Kenneth. Uh, she's wearing jeans. <laughs> um, and I think tennis shoes. Okay. Um, and maybe a maroon top. Okay. So. Thank, thank you. And you guys, you, you need to help me and make sure these guys are not cheating. <laughs> Just kind of look. 
Okay, uh, so Brandon. Rugby shirt and jeans and his papers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Barry? New life shirt, um, dark green stretchy pants and shoes, I think. He was going to wear tennis shoes, but they had something. <laughs> We're getting some details. <laughs> okay, what color is her uh, T-shirt? Blue. Blue. All right. All right. Wow. Okay. Um, I think Sid has on jeans and his tennis shoes. I think they're gray, maybe. And then I think he's got on a dark gray pullover shirt. Maybe. That's all I know. You did great. First of all, Brenda dresses Barry, so that's the only reason she needs it. <laughs> um, Brenda picked out So, uh, Krista, uh, she has a blue jean jacket on. Is that right? Okay. Uh, I think she, she would typically wear black pants with it. No? Okay. And uh, Who are you talking to? There's... <laughs> Uh, she has over 30 pair of shoes, so I'm not even going to guess on that. Any guess? Uh, I don't know. Maybe some, some kind of tennis shoe. Uh, maybe color? Black with white on it. Well, thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, can we just give them another hand? <laughs> I... Uh, okay. I have to tell you something. You never know how this is going to turn out. You can, it's unpredictable. I mean, I think they did much better than I expected people to do, uh, except for a couple misses completely. Um, <clears throat> and that kind of ru uh, ruins my illustration that I prepared. Yeah. Um, but I do thank you for the participation. Uh, so, uh, but... I don't know, if you're, if you're here with your spouse, you know, when I, when I ask that question, can you raise your hand and uh, tell me if you just, when I said, what is your spouse wearing, did you, who, who looked at their spouse and started uh, checking, you know, making sure? All right. Okay. Some of you. Um, the thing is, uh, we, don't, we, don't always, uh, we don't always know. And the point of this illustration was not to give you a reason for an argument on the way back home <laughs> saying, you never pay attention to what I'm wearing, you know. You never say, oh, this looks good on you, you know. Or saying, uh, well, if we were called on the stage, how, would you, how well would you do? I mean, that's not the point, okay? So, uh, because sometimes we seem to be, it's like a supernatural gift with some couples, some of us, you know, we just, we don't need a special reason to, for, a, for an argument, you know, we can turn anything pretty much into an argument. Oh, that was, uh, it was about one o'clock when we walked out, it was not one o'clock, it was one thirty. you know, one, actually one thirty-two, and then the argument starts, okay, so that's, that's really not the point, the, the, the point uh, is what I would, what I call the focus shift. Uh, and let me explain what I mean by that. I took, uh, last week, I took a couple of pictures just outside the church here. And I want to show you the first one, one first. And uh, see, uh, wh where, where's the focus? Focus on, yeah, what do you see uh, in the back? The pool house, yeah. Do you see, what's, what's on the right side of the screen? Uh, it's a blue book, yeah. Do you, do you know what the title is? Uh, huh? It's an... Uh, <laughs> you liked the Hebrew-Russian speech last night, last week, right? Um, okay, so can we look at the second one, please? Oh, it's, uh, it's a blue book. You're right. But now we can see the title, right? Can you see the pool house from here? You know why? Because it's out of focus. Because the focus was shifted, was switched to the book. 
And so this is kind of what happens um, when in photography, uh, if, if you ever, you know, learned photography, you know that when you, when you focus on some, something close, the stuff in the back, that's the, the things that are far out, uh, they become blurry. So the object of, that you focus on is in focus. Everything else kind of gets blurry. And uh, as maybe it would have worked uh, if it was not cold and everybody was wearing something more, you know, with more variety, then, then maybe some people would say, well, I don't remember. I don't, I don't really know. But I got people who are really good, really good. Mem- uh, they know each other really well and uh, pay attention. So ruin my illustration. But the, the point is, when we focus on ourselves sometimes, things around us get blurry, including the closest people to us. Sometimes we are so focused on ourselves that everything else around us gets blurred out. And... Um, and we do the same in other areas of life, too. Um, I want to show you another picture, uh, the next one. Is there a next one? Okay, all right. Um, it's what, they, what people often call group photo. Actually, excellent day, work day, when the youth group came and uh, helped uh, with some uh, preparation of, of, the, of that building. <clears throat> so, okay, question. Um, how do you know if a group photo is good or not? How do you judge usually? When you see a group photo that you're, you're in, the, in that photo, who is the first person you're looking for? Oh, yeah. And so if I'm there in the picture and my eyes are closed or, or I have a weird face, like, you know, somebody clicked on the, uh, took a picture at the moment of I was at, uh, doing something like that, then we're saying the photo is no good, right? And it doesn't matter to us if everybody else is perfectly fine. We're saying, no, the, the photo is not good. And so uh, this is an excellent photo, by the way. Um, Somebody may disagree, but uh, so this is the criteria that we use a lot. So, and and just a tip, just a tip, maybe a helpful tip for you. If if you're concerned that maybe you don't look very good on the photo, on the group photo, and you don't pay attention too much, don't focus on it too much, because do you know what other people are focused on? They probably won't even know that your eyes are closed or something. Everybody's pretty much trying to look at wh- how they look on that picture. If, ha- if their eyes are open, if they're smiling, the picture is good. You know? So don't, don't stress too much about it. As Christians, we're not immune uh, to focusing on ourselves too much. And sometimes it can be very hard to help others win the race if we are focusing our, on ourselves too much, on that, if we're looking at the group picture at the church and we're focusing ourselves too much, it may be very difficult for us to help other people win the race. And what they call uh, the conflict of interest happens. And sometimes things like that, things like that happen in church. It's too cold for me. It's too hot for me. It's too loud for me. It's too quiet. I can't hear anything. So you got to change that. And people who are doing the sound, they're like, who do I listen to? You know, people are turning the AC. Who, who do I listen to? And then we're talking about several different things. Like, well, I don't think it's a good idea. It doesn't inspire me at all. It doesn't help me at all. You know, or somebody else says, no, it's a great idea. So who, who do we focus on? Who, who do we listen on? Two, conflict of interest. We sometimes we get too obsessed with how I, I feel, how helpful I find this idea, how great this idea seems to me. And so, what I want us to do today is to read a passage, uh, uh, that passage in Philippians uh, chapter two, 
where um, God is talking through Paul to some Christians about how they can actually help other people win. And this passage is in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. And, you know, sometimes we, um, we, we read a passage or listen to a sermon and there's a passage and sometimes we can't, can't remember where it was, what the passage was actually was. This one is actually easy, easy to remember. It's chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, and then Philippians. So you just do like 2, 3, 4. Philippians, 2, 3, 4. Philippians, right? And Hayden and uh, Jesse, they know it's like a drum beat, you know, like 2, 3, 4, and then the field. Two, three, four. Two, three, four. Philippians. I'm trying to help you guys. Um, I'm just making the fool of myself here, okay? So two, three, four. Philippians. Two, three, four. Philippians. Okay, I think we're ready uh, for the passage. Okay. If you don't remember anything else, I hope you remember this part. <laughs> All right, so this is what Paul is talking to the Christ, uh, about to Christians in the church in Philippi. And this is what he says. And please listen to him. Try to hear what he's trying to say. He's saying this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Ooh. What kind of Bible did you get that passage from? I don't remember it talking, being that um, radical or, you know, exclusive or inclusive. I don't know. So I think Paul is trying to tell us here is that the key to helping others win, win the race, is the focus shift. I think Paul is saying if you want to help other people win, you need to shift your focus. And uh, the victory is so much sweeter when other people, when you help other people win as well. The victory, your own victory, is so much sweeter when you help other people as w- will <clears throat> win as well. Sorry. So what is, what is God, through Paul, trying to tell Christians in the church in Philippi uh, to do? And what he's saying here is so unnatural. It's so counterintuitive. It's not something that we wake up thinking, oh, I guess today I'll do nothing out of selfish ambition, and I'll just... Just all I will do is put everybody else above myself. I mean, this is not what we think about when we wake up. This is not, most of the time, it's not the, our idea and the, 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 the mood, I guess, we, that we have. So, let's, let's look at it. He says, do nothing. Nothing. Um, what percentage is nothing? How many percent is that? Zero. I mean, I'm not very good at math, but I know nothing is zero. He's saying do nothing. So there is, there is really no... He's, Paul is being kind of radical here. He's not giving us or leaving us any room to negotiate or haggle with him. He's like, do nothing. I mean, nothing, nothing? Yeah, nothing, nothing. Zero percent, nothing. And some of us are saying, who? Do nothing. What Bible translation is that? I like that. Uh, do nothing. I'll buy it. I'll buy that Bible. I mean, when, you know, if God tells me to do nothing, hey. No, it's not a complete sentence, okay? So he's saying, do nothing out of selfish ambition or worthless pride, or if we can rephrase that, vain conceit. Do nothing out of selfish motives, selfish motivation selfish ambition, or your pride that doesn't, uh, is not worth anything. It's unacceptable as motive for God. Basically, God is saying selfishness, selfishness, ambition, 
and pride. No, 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 no. Doesn't work. Not acceptable. Maybe a no, 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 no. No. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or pride, vain conceit. So why would Paul say that? Is it just um, unjustified suspicion? Is he, is he just suspecting the Christians in Philippi of something that can really, does, you know, not having any reason, he just thinks worse of themselves than they really were? I think the reason we read these verse, uh, words here is because God knows us too well. And he knows, he knows that we tend to focus on ourselves too much. So much that everything else around us and everybody else around us sometimes get too blurry that we cannot see anything or anybody. We are so focused on how we feel that we do not see people around us with, that hurt, that have pain in their life, and we just crush people sometimes with, their wor- with our words. We just crush them. We think, well, if I have it hard, then this is... You know, um, when, when something hurts, it hurts. It affects everything we say. It affects how we behave. And sometimes we're, we snap at people because we think they don't care how we, about how we feel. What we do not think about, what we don't know, is the pain that they carry. Is the situation that they're in right now because it's blurry. Because right now, we're focused on ourselves, and everything else is blurry. And every, everybody else is blurry. I think Paul, I mean, I, I don't think God would mention something like that if it, was, if it was never a problem with us. I think the reason he's talking about this is exactly because it's often a problem in our case. That we focus so much on ourselves that everything else around us gets out of focus. Paul continues. He says, do do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, so instead, in humility, and this is where we go, duh, in humility, yeah, if you don't do anything out of selfishness, yes, it is called humility. But he's just making sure That we understand. He's saying, but in humility, rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Ooh. I don't know how to do that. Value others above myself. Hard. Hard to do. And then he adds, not looking to your own interests, but others. And we say, does everybody have to participate? May I be excused? May I get off this bus? I kind of don't like the direction that it's going to. And Paul says, no. It says, each of you Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Okay, another math problem. How many percent is each of you? A hundred. So do nothing out of selfish ambition is zero, and each of you is a hundred percent. All of you. Um, what's each of you in Texan? All y'all, right. <laughs> That's all y'all. <laughs> I don't know. How's like, how's, what, what is it in Texan? Uh, e- each of us, I'm including me. <laughs> okay. I have to learn that one, because it definitely includes me. And there's really, there's really no room for us to negotiate. Paul is being really radical in this passage. 
He's talking, do nothing out of selfish ambition. And then each of you, each of you, 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 and you, uh, you have to do everything considering others above yourself, thinking of their interests first. Man, that's hard. That's really hard. And so God is talking through Paul to the church in Philippi and telling them this. He's saying the key to helping others win the race is to shift, to shift the focus, to change the focus from yourself onto other people around you. And it's amazing. It's amazing how things change when, you, when we stop thinking about ourselves, our problem, our pain, our hurt, and start going and talking and listening and hearing what's going on in people's lives. You start hearing stories, you're like, I'm a blessed person. I don't have it as hard as they do. I don't have this much pain in my, heart, in my heart and in my life. Thank you, God, for blessing me. It changes everything. It changes my focus from myself onto others. And my attitude starts to change. Just think about how would our church change if all of us, all y'all, all y'all, all y'all, <laughs> us, <laughs> uh, would do nothing out of selfish motivation, but doing, start doing everything, looking out to the interests of others. Ooh. We're talking about things changing in a big time. Um, I mean, no conflict, no gossip, no argument, no judging others, no fits of anger, no irritation, no accusation. And then instead, there would be humility, love, care for other people, helping and serving. No ministry is lacking volunteers. Um, I mean, sounds like the church that all of us want to be a part of, right? Just think about what would our marriages be like what would our marriages be like if we did nothing out of selfish motives and no elbowing right now? Don't. No. It's, you, it's not for your spouse. It's for you. It's for me. Just think about how transformed our marriages would be if we did nothing out of selfish motives but considered our spouse's interest above our own. How would it change the way we share good news with people if we cared more about them than us? How would it change the way we, we act and treat others at work or at school? And the big question for each one of us is this one. Where? What area of my life do I need to shift the focus from myself to other people? And I know there are, uh, there are thoughts that we have here right now, thinking, can I get off this bus? Do I have to do it? Shifting focus is so hard. Helping others win the race why did I, not, did I even start considering this idea? Winning other people, win the race, is so hard. Why bother, right? Why bother? Well, the reason why bother is that it will literally, if we do take it seriously, it will literally transform us and our church. Just imagine if for the next month, everybody in New Life Church took this seriously. I mean, you would see huge changes just in one month. In one month. And I want to uh, read you a story. I, was, uh, I don't know if it's true or not. I was trying to find the source. I wasn't able to. So just, uh, just wanted to share this with you, okay? 
One day, when I was a freshman in high school, I saw a kid from my class walking home from school. His name was Kyle. It looked like he was carrying all of his books. And I thought to myself, why would anyone bring home all his books on a Friday? He must really be a nerd. I had quite a weekend planned, parties and a football game with my friends tomorrow afternoon, so I shrugged my shoulders and went on. As I was walking, I saw a bunch of kids running toward him. They ran at him, knocking all his books out of his arms and tripping him, so he landed in the dirt. His glasses went flying, and I saw them land in the grass about 10 feet from him. He looked up, and I saw this terrible sadness in his eyes. My heart went out to him. So I jogged over to him, and as he was crawling around looking for his glasses, I saw a tear in his eye. As I handed him his glasses, I said, those guys are jerks. They really should get lives. He looked at me and said, thanks. There was a big smile on his face. It was one of those smiles that showed real gratitude. I helped him pick up his books and asked him where he lived. As it turned out, he lived near me, so I asked him why I had never seen him before. He said he had gone to private school before now. I would have never hung out with a private school kid before. We talked all the way home, and I carried his books. He turned out to be a pretty cool kid. I asked him if he wanted to play football on Saturday with me and my friends. He said yes. We hung all weekend, and the more I got to know Kyle, the more I liked him. And my friends thought the same of him. Monday morning came, and there was Kyle with his huge stacks of, stack of books again. I stopped him and said, boy, you're going to really build some serious muscles with this pile of books every day. He just laughed and handed me half the books. Over the next four years, Kyle and I became best friends. When we were seniors, we began to think about college. Kyle decided on Georgetown, and I was going to Duke. I knew that we would, be, would, we would always be friends, that, and that the miles would never be a problem. He was going to be a doctor, and I was going for business on a football scholarship. Kyle was valedictorian of his class. I teased him all the time about being a nerd. He had to prepare a speech for graduation. I was so glad it wasn't me having to get up there and speak. Graduation day, I saw Kyle. He looked great. He was one of those guys that really found himself during high school. He filled out and actually looked good in glasses. He had more dates than me, and all the girls loved him. Boy, sometimes I was jealous. Today was one of those days. I could see that he was nervous about his speech, so I smacked him on the back and said, Hey, big guy, you'll be great. He looked at me with one of those looks, the really grateful ones, and smiled. Thanks, he said. As he started his speech, he cleared his throat and began. Graduation is a time to thank those who helped you make it through those tough years. Your parents, your teachers, your siblings, maybe a coach, but mostly your friends. I'm here to tell all of you that being a friend to someone is the best gift you can give them. I'm going to tell you a story. I just looked at my friend with, with disbelief as he told the story of the first day we met. He had planned to kill himself over the weekend. He talked of how he had cleaned out his locker so that his mom wouldn't have to do it later and was carrying his stuff home. He looked hard at me and gave me a little smile. Thankfully, I was saved. My friend saved me from doing the unspeakable and I heard the gasp go through the crowd as this handsome, popular boy told us all about his weakest moment. I, I saw his mom and dad looking at me and smiling that same grateful smile. Not until that moment did I realize, did I realize its depth. So why bother? Helping others win. 
if shifting focus from myself to others is so hard. And one of the reasons, not only because this can change the church, but because what we say and what we do has eternal consequences and can potentially save someone's eternal life. And also because it brings a smile to our Heavenly Father's face, just like it did with those parents there. So we're thankful that somebody shifted focus from themselves onto their son. Our Heavenly Father does that too. When, you, when he sees us, when we shift focus from ourselves to somebody else, He's looking at us and smiles, smiles. The key to helping others win is shifting focus. And the victory is so much sweeter when we also help other people win as well. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you everybody for uh, all the hard work and your uh, participation and pre preparing for the harvest party. Um, I know that takes some focus shifting, uh, maybe a lot of focus shifting. And we'll be here tonight. Uh, and the, the goal, I want us to remember the goal. The goal of this whole thing that we've put so much time and work into is um, to share the love of Jesus with people who maybe never will hear that. This is their chance. This is our chance to do nothing out of our own selfish ambition, but to put other people's interests first. So thank, I want to thank everybody who has already uh, done a lot and Thank those who will come and do much more. So let's, um, let's give it uh, all of our energy and all of our effort and all of our heart. Uh, this is a big event. Uh, uh, we're trying to make Jesus famous. We're, we're trying to share the good news of uh, Jesus with people. So I want to thank you. And so uh, we'll see you later uh, today at the Harvest Party. Uh, and thank you for shifting the focus off of yourself and to other people who need it. Let's pray. Jesus, we want to thank you for not doing anything out of your selfish ambitions, but considering other interests above your own. When you were on the way to the cross, when you endured hardships and mocking and those stupid questions when people tried to trap you and uh, find fault with you, when people laughed, when people tried to kill you, when people hated, when people really wanted your death. We wanted to thank you for um, the fact that you went to the very end of the path, that you took up your cross and carried it to the very end. And by doing that, giving us a chance to be forgiven. Showing us what your Father's love looks like. Please, please help our hearts to change. And may your love motivate us to do what we do. And in your son's name we pray, O oh Father. Amen.